Uh, hmm. No, I've got us all. No, I got us all. We're good. I got ten windows. Yeah. Okay. You well, go to gallery there's, view. There was um there were seven others yesterday, so we're we're. That's all oh, right, right. Yeah. I'm just missing it. Okay. Alrighty, Dwayne, we're starting to get a significant number of folks. Why don't you go ahead and give it a start? All right. Uh, everyone, thank you for coming to our event tonight. This is uh, in celebration of, uh, from a certain point of view, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I apologize in advance, but I'm just going to mention who's here participating. And I'd rather go through the extensive bios because everyone here has been too bloody prolific. But uh, going across my screen, we have Django Wexler, Rob Hart, Brittany N. Williams, uh, Lillian Rivera, Karen Strong, Lydia Kang. And the whole thing is going to be run here by Tom Holler, the editor of Boston Chief. And uh, you can get the book from us if you haven't already. And this eventually will be up on our website uh, in a few days. So let's go from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joanne. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to join us tonight. Um, thank you for hanging out. Um, if this is your first night with us, um, thank you so much for making time uh, on this uh, wonderful Thursday and joining us to talk about from a certain point of view. If you've been with us for the other two events, thank you so much for spending most of your week with us. It's been um, so much fun uh, and we appreciate you staying up late each night to, to hang out and talk about Star Wars, which is really like the best thing that you can hang out, uh, stay up late and hang out and talk about. So. Um, uh, as you probably, many of you may know, if you happen to have a question during the event, you want us to, to address it, if we can, just drop it into the little Q&A module. I'll be keeping an eye on it and we'll, we'll pull those into the conversation um, as we go. And uh, yeah, we are uh, you know, probably gonna go for about 75 minutes-ish. Um, so if anyone you know is uh, making plans for, for dinner or other such things, uh, wants to plan your takeout order to show up right when this ends or anything like that, um, that's probably where we'll be, but you know, we'll play it by ear and we'll happily hang out a little bit longer if things are going well. Um, so this is really cool. Um, this is the third night in a row that we've been doing this. We are in total hanging out with, having hang, hung out with 19 of the 40 authors. Um, but tonight, What's pretty cool is that um, we have six amazing authors with us and all of them, all of them are making their debut as a Star Wars author. This, this project, these stories are their first, you know, forays into Star Wars as, you know, official writers. Um, and so we are absolutely going to talk about that, but that, I'm super excited about that. Um, it was not entirely by design when we were mapping out who was going to hang out each night, but it just sort of fell into place that way, and it was a really kind of wonderful thing. Uh, so we're going to start uh, with um, Lilium Rivera um, for your story, Beyond the Clouds, um, not to be confused with another person on this panel's story, who <laughs> Into the Clouds, which has a very similar name, and we'll get to that soon. You had, um, kind of really from the start, you had a very specific character type and character perspective in mind for your heroine, um, Isabella. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yes. All right, I've been practicing <laughs> all day. I got it written phonetically. Isabella, yes. So um, I would share with us why this original perspective and this character was so important to you. Because it's one of many original characters in the book. You didn't choose, you know, like a known pilot that you're going to stand on. This is an original character based on yeah. someone best. Um, can I just say that when I got the email, asking me to be a part of this that I screamed. Can I just say that? You can, you have. Because I <laughs> freaked out. I was just literally like, oh my God, oh my God. So it was like a big deal for me. It was just a big deal for it to be even asked. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, you know, when I was at, you know, when, when I got that request and then I was just like, oh, how am I going to do this? And I, you know, there's their parameters to, to how to, to write this, you know, I knew Empire Strikes, I like, I, I watched it again and again and again, because, you know, how many times have I watched it? I watched it hundreds of times. And so, and it is by far my favorite of that trilogy. Right. And so then I was like, I'm in it. I'm, I'm down to do this. I'm going to, but I knew for a fact that I wanted to create a, a new character. Because um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm Latina, <laughs> you know, and I wanted to, I'm all about um, a Star Wars, you know, I'm all about like, you know, poppies in space. I'm all about <laughs> all of this, you know, and I wanted to make sure that I added, um, you know, a Latina in there. And so then that was really, that was the only thing I was thinking about. I was really just thinking about like, how can I add um, more uh, brown people in space? brown people in Star Wars and um, and so then I thought of this character and I wanted her to just be this kind of like you know she wants to be a, a bounty hunter she wants she wants that life 
And um, what does that look like? <laughs> so it was a great way for me to explore that world and explore Cloud City and, and bring someone new and, and just be, you know, I don't know, I was so excited about it that I wanted to like, let's, let's get this new character, someone that is just, just as, as fresh faced as, as I am coming in, just trying to write this world, so. That is awesome. And I love too that you picked someone who wants to be a bounty hunter in the middle of the film that is, you know, in part defined by the bounty hunters because the bounty hunters have, you know, that iconic scene. And then obviously Boba Fett plays a really big part. And so it was great to see the perspective in your story of a character of like, why would anyone aspire to be a bounty hunter who's not just like, they're a bounty hunter because they're evil, you know, in the way that some of the bounty hunters kind of are. And so that is such a great part of your character. Also, they get to have a really amazing cape and sort of, you know, stylish pantsuit, which is, uh, which is lovely. We're going to need to see official art of that someday. Um, I'm like all about the fashion. I'm like, I really actually just want it more. Can we go to the department stores? Like, how, what is, what are people wearing? <laughs> I mean, and bounty hunters. City. You know, it's all like pockets and weapons, where can I store stuff, you know? Exactly. And then you're on Cloud City and Lando is setting a very high bar for fashion. So like, you know, you need to, you need to up your game. Speaking of fashion, speaking of Cloud City, and like I said, speaking of the clouds, um, yeah. Aaron Strong, your story Into the Clouds, which I have to say, I, we sort of didn't notice that the two of you had very similar sounding titles until like very late into the process. I think Isn't it was that literally your job? Well, it's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> these stories. Uh, we were proofing, I think it was the first time we were actually proofing the table of contents, you know, and, and I was proofing to make sure that all the name, you know, every all the names were spelled right in the table of contents itself. And I just happened to, that was when I, the first time I had seen the two of them together or seen them on the same page. And then I was like, eh, they're different enough. They're two of short stories. This one. I love sharing a title with Lillian. What yeah. are you saying? We got yeah, Belden's, we got Belden's in our story. Exactly. It's all good. So Karen Strong, in Into the Clouds, you introduce us to, speaking of fantastic and fashionable characters, this amazing character in uh, Jalen and her romantic foil, Dress, uh, Dresh Lipson, which is like, that's a fabulous name. The other night, uh, anyone who was here, I think on Tuesday, we talked a little bit about Star Wars names. That is a Star Wars name. That just <laughs> is, like, you, it just sounds like fun. Uh, I, I want to know about the, 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 both the opportunity and the challenge about wanting to create kind of your own very kind of classic romantic Star Wars relationship, which is playing out in the middle of the Star Wars film that is about the most famous Star Wars romantic relationship. Uh, oh yeah, I this is this is Jalen Jalen and Dresh is totally a homage to Han and Leia, obviously. Um, I love the, the trope of the scoundrel and the society girl, the royalty. And so I, I knew that I wanted to pay some homage to that. And I also knew, just like what Lillian said, I needed my, my character to be stylish. I wanted her to be rich. So how do you be rich on Cloud City? You're Tabata Gas Tycoon, right? Perfect. So, you know, I knew that I wanted her to see Princess Leia as, you know, an aspirational figure. So what better way to cosplay Princess Leia than wear the same kind of cloak that she wears on Bespin, her Bespin outfit. So I really, I liked playing on those. I liked her being sort of like seeing Princess Leia in, in battle with the stormtroopers to make her decide that she needs to pick a side. So. I think it was really great because you, you know, early in the film in, in Hoth, we seeing all these people who are inspired by Leia, but obviously they're all part of the rebellion. They're just in proximity to her. And so it's, it's not, it's, it's natural. And what's interesting is now we get to Bespin, which is this place that's so far removed from the rebellion and everything that we know and any sense of who Leia is or her stature in the galaxy. And yet you so, so brilliantly show us the very simple ways in which someone like Leia, you are just so drawn to, she's so luminous figuratively and literally speaking, <laughs> that a character like Jalen would be drawn to her and drawn to the cause that she represents. It's, it's so well, it's so well executed, it's great. Uh, yeah, when I was a kid, I had a Bestman outfit. I had a cosplay Bestman outfit for Halloween. I used to twirl in the mirror. So having Jalen twirl in the mirror was full circle. <laughs> that is perfect, that is great. Um, in some ways, this I, I talked about how this is the event where we're talking to people who are all making their Star Wars debut. This also ends up being a little bit like um, the Bespin, uh, the Bespin part of the film, uh, uh, um, 
event because of the number of stories that take place there. Um, and one of those involves um, Rob Hart and uh, a certain character who, who plays a starring role in uh, his story, Do on Batu. Um, Rob, you took on the <laughs> challenge of writing for the character Will Rowe Hood, for um, whom many uh, know him as that guy with the ice cream machine who's running around Cloud City. Um, yep. Rob, I don't know if you know this, but he, Will Rowe Hood is sort of a popular cult side character, just a little bit, like ever so tiny. Yeah. Um, so how much, if any, pressure did you feel in taking on the character of Will Rowe Hood, and how did you sort of manage the expectation of this character? Oh, I mean, it was an immense amount of pressure, <laughs> but I feel like anyone writing Star Wars is going to kind of feel that. Um, you know, I, I, I will admit I cheated a little bit because uh, so when I got the email, I was sitting at my buddy's bar uh, and uh, he, I like I know Star Wars, but he's like a threat level Star Wars nerd. And I was like, hey, man, who is like the coolest like blink and you'll miss him character in Empire, like the weirdest little character that you would love to see a story from? He was like, go ice cream maker guy. So, and I didn't even know that when I look him up and I'm like, yep, yep, this is the one. And, uh, you know, it was weird because on one hand, there was already a lot of sort of extended universe information about the character. And I knew that I was kind of be creating like this new sort of backstory for him. I felt like the most important thing I can do really was just get an ice cream reference into the story, uh, which had me uh, like just before I filed it, I was like, oh man, I really need to get that in. And then I, I'm like Googling, like, what is the Star Wars version of ice cream, which is Nectos Freeze. And I was just like, this is just the weirdest, coolest job anyone has ever had. It really is. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you got that in there. And I also saw you were doing very serious ice cream research all summer um, with Jenny's ice cream. It's not sponsored, but I love you, Jenny's ice cream. So great work there. I appreciate your commitment to the craft of research and ice cream. Um, so most of those stories take place, they take us to Best Ben and Cloud City, uh, a story that actually takes place a little earlier in the uh, film, um, but does involve clouds because, well, not really because we're, we're in space, but involves flying. Um, so that's, that's the coolest transition I can make here is Django Wexler and your story, Amara Kell's Rules for Thai Pilot Survival, parentheses, maybe. Um, in your story, we meet a Thai pilot, Amara Kell, um, and she is very cool. Amara Kell is cool. She has all these rules about flying a tie. Those rules are cool. The way she talks is cool. Her girlfriend is super cool, who's another pilot that we meet in the story. Basically, your entire story makes the idea of being a tie pilot very, very cool. So what makes a tie, what makes a Star Wars pilot story like so cool and awesome? And what is it about like the, the ties as a ship that kind of drew you to wanting to write that kind of pilot story as opposed to like X-Wing pilots or, or, or anything else? I mean, I think a big part of it is that we don't get it. We don't, there are no TIE pilots who don't wear masks in the movies, as far as I know. Um, we, you know, we see a lot of X-Wing pilots. A lot of them even have names, even though they all die. Um, but we don't see any of the TIE pilots, which, you know, is fine. You know, they're the bad guys. But like, it always just makes me, whenever there's something that's sort of left out like that, it makes me wonder about it and what those people's lives must be like. And especially with the TIE pilots, because they seem so expendable, but almost like eager. Like, you know, they're always crashing into things as they try to pursue the heroes, doing this like incredibly death-defying stuff. It's not an empire, but like they follow the, the Falcon into the second Death Star, into these like incredibly tight corners. And we're like, like, you gotta be pretty motivated to do that, right? Like, so, you know, it, wouldn't it be easier to just hang around on the outside and be like, let someone else do it? Um, and so, so thinking about that um, kind of got me there. And the idea of like, you know, if you're, an ex if you're a TIE pilot who's been doing this for a long time, you know, you must have this attitude where you've seen all these people come and go because the casualty rate is pretty high. Um, and so what is, what is that character like? And that was kind of where that, that came in. Um, there's also, if you Google um, on YouTube, there's a short film called TIE Fighter and animation that's just amazing. And ever since that, I was like, oh God, I want to do this, TIE Pilots. And also I play TIE Pilots in the X-Wing Miniatures game. So I'm kind of working. 
Uh, I have to say that, you know, I've been playing some Star Wars squadrons in the, in the, the weeks since the game came out in October, and I have had Amara Kel and her rules uh, in my head uh, every time I play as a TIE, uh, TIE pilot, and I have to say that I am not expert at all. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> you know what Star Wars squadrons, of course, makes me think about is that despite its cool look, the TIE fighter is such a terrible design because you can't, your, your view to either side is blocked by these giant wings. Like, how could you possibly fly that? Always forward, just always yeah, forward. Just keep <laughs> going. <laughs> Until you hit something. Um, but it, it is, um, it's a really great, and it is a great example of, of this amazing character voice who, even though they are essentially a nameless, you know, a faceless TIE fighter pilot just jumps off the page at you, uh, is, is really great. Um, we go from a very, you know, co uh, very kind of um, confident, cocky, very um, outgoing character in Amara Kel to um, Lydia Kang. Your story, who star, which stars a droid 21B, who is not really um, quite as, let's say, center stage as that kind <laughs> of character. Um, in, I try not to play favorites with this anthology, but your story might have the most perfect title of any story in the entire thing, which is Right Hand Man, which is just, uh, it's just so perfect. Um, but I actually don't want to ask you about 2-1-B so specifically. Um, I want to ask you about, you are writing a story that takes place during very much at the end of the film, and you are writing a story at a time where you get to write new dialogue for Luke Skywalker at maybe, probably, the most pivotal moment in this character's life, like five seconds after, the most important thing that could ever happen to him. So, was that something that occurred to you like, when you started, when you were like, oh, that's the character in the scene I want? And then like, what was that challenge like stepping into not just 2-1-B's shoes, you know, well, he doesn't wear shoes, but you know what I mean, <laughs> and Luke Skywalker's. So, wow. So like, when I got the email, um, I, I was sort of having these two very different emotions and one was, like pure joy, like, oh my God, I have to do this. And the other one was terror because I was completely afraid that I wasn't going to be able to do justice to a character new or existing to the universe. I just felt like there's so much um, depth to this particular movie. And I was like, there's no way I'm not going to be able to do this well. Like, how could I possibly, I like my mind was drawing a blank and I'm like, I'm not to say no. Cause I don't, I don't know what I would do. I don't know if I could do it well. Um, and then I started really thinking about the story and I'm like, well, who do I really kind of um, identify with in the story? Let's just start there with the existing characters. And it was really kind of ridiculous because I, I can't believe I didn't think about this immediately, but it took me a while to, to come up with it. But then I realized 2-1-B was the person who made the most sense because I'm a practicing physician. So I was like, oh, 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 I get this. I was like, I just, I, I you know, I, I felt very comfortable stepping into his, his treads, whatever you want to call them, right, and, and, and sort of knowing what it would be like to treat somebody who is having um, an emotional and physical crisis. I was like, this is familiar to me. I, I, can, I think I can do this. But it occurred to me as I was writing it, I was like, I am writing dialogue. Luke is speaking. I'm, I'm deleting Luke's dialogue. I'm creating Luke's dialogue. I'm correcting typos in Luke's dialogue. It was, I didn't actually think about it, I think, that hard because I was just trying to make sure that what I was doing made sense with what Luke would be going through at the moment. Um, and knowing very distinctly sort of what his face looked like right before that scene and right after the scene, after his hand is, um, is affixed and he's looking out um, you know, the window with Leia and he has this very particular, sorry about the dogs, he has a very particular look on his face, which is um, kind of resolute and sad but there is that little inkling of, of hope in there as well. And there's hope in, in Leia's face as well. So I'm like, I have to transition him from the worst news of his life, the most devastating experience also physically of his life to this moment, this scene at the end. It was a huge challenge, but I felt like I could, I, I just kind of dove into it and it sort of happened. Sorry about the dog. Yeah, it's totally great. The dogs probably, clearly agree with all of your points. There's probably a raccoon outside, can't control that. <laughs> But um, 
yeah, so I, I think I, I got it wrong a couple of times. I had to rewrite it several times just to, to make sure I, I got it right. And um, it was really intimidating. And uh, I think I had to ask some friends also who are like diehard Star Wars fans, like, and they, you know, getting some feedback about like, you know, how would Luke speak to somebody like that? Like, how would you speak to a medical person, right? Um, would he be really formal? Would he not? And I had to sort of go back to some of the really basics of what kind of a character is Luke. You know, he's still a kid in many ways, and yet he also has been through a lot of stuff. So it, it was really, really fascinating and just a huge honor and privilege to, to put words on the paper for that scene. It, it's, it's really, it's really tremendous. And it's, I mean, so many ways, so many of these stories, because this book and this anthology was made during the wildest, weirdest, craziest, scariest, most ang anxiety inducing year, you know, most of us uh, have ever and, and maybe will ever experience. This story, it was one of those stories that was just such a bomb to hear Luke Skywalker and Miss Droid. Again, the dogs agree with me. Uh, <laughs> Luke Skywalker and Miss Droid talking about hope and talking about the force and talking about um, just good, wonderful things. And the fact that one of them is a droid, one of them is a robot, and one of them is, you know, is, is Luke Skywalker. It didn't make it, it was these two characters have these great interactions. Um, and again, it has the most perfect title right in there. I think you had that title in there since like you were pitching the idea and we were just like, yep, that's the title. That's so good. Um, <laughs> speaking of intimidating um, and speaking of challenges and speaking of droids, uh, I, I, I have to say that I think few authors in the anthology set themselves a harder baseline task than uh, Brittany, than you did with your story, Faith in an Old Friend, because you are revisiting L337, you know, the wonderful droid that was introduced to us in Solo and, uh, who, you know, who met a, a, a pretty um, interesting fate, but that we know is still present in Empire. And so first of all, I'm curious to know what made you decide to sort of take up this challenge of, of, of revisiting and coming back to L3. But then the added challenge of, you don't have the challenge of just bringing L3, um, quote unquote, to life on the story, but not just a second droid consciousness within the Falcon, but a third one. You are essentially creating the three droid brains or voices of the Falcon. So talk me through how you tackled this incredible task. Uh, yeah, so um, I remember when my agent um, hit me up and let me know that I had been invited and I was like, oh my God, tell him yes, just say yes, just say yes. And she like sent the, the yes. And then I was like, okay, who am I going to do? And I was making this like list. I was digging deep into like the trenches. And then I was like, you know what? I can, I, I wonder if they'll let me do the Millennium Falcon L337. So I also like, I think it took me 15 minutes and I emailed my agent back and I was like, can you ask them if I can do the Millennium Falcon slash L337? Like, just, just ask them that, just see if they're gonna say yes. Um, and I say this as a person who saw Solo in the theater wearing an L337 Droid Rights t-shirt and then had to sit through L337 getting blown to pieces and then uploaded into a spaceship that Lando then lost in a card game. Um, so I had a lot of feelings about this character already. Um, so I, like, I was like, I got to do it. I got to do it for me. I got to do it for my people, like all the L3 fans. Like, I just, I got to do this for us, y'all. So um, I asked, they, y'all said yes. Um, and then I realized uh, I have to write a story about a character who can't actually do anything, um, which was <laughs> cool. I, I had that like uh, that Brooklyn Nine Nine moment where it was like, great, they said yes, yes. Now let me write this story. Let me pitch it. And I was like, okay, oh, cool, 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 cool. Um, but once I once I got a hook in, um, I guess like writing the dialogue for all the characters was the easiest part. Uh, I could kind of hear Phoebe Waller Bridge's voice in my head as I was writing L 3s dialogue. Um. And I just thought to myself, all right, if there are gonna be, so one of the brains is a corporate slicer droid. So like, what would a good voice be for like a corporate slicer espionage droid? Like, what would that sound like? And then I was like, the other one is a transport droid. So like, what would be a fun voice for that? And how would these three distinct voices play off of each other? Um, and who are three, like what three voices would be cool to just spend 
two to 4,000 words with. And yeah, not actually doing anything, just kind of like chatting and just talking, you know, talking shit. So, and then I, I gave myself the added difficulty of putting in one more droid with Treadwell. <laughs> and so it's like, all right, well, now I got to come up with a, a fourth voice. And, you know, we all know of binary as like what we hear from BB-8 or what we hear from uh, R2-D2. So it was nice to, to put that into language language in a way and to kind of give it a rhythm, give it a style, um, give everybody personalities and to let everybody know that L3 is okay in the Falcon. She's having a good time. We don't have to be sad anymore. Uh, I will tell you that when you sent that idea in, we are all like, oh my gosh, yes, please do an L3 story. But then we all have the thought of, man, how is she going to pull this off? Well, this is going to be fun to watch. You know, like it's going to be fun to see. And, and actually that happened with so many of the story ideas is that, you know, we'd, get, we'd be so, ex so excited about the initial pitch. But in our, in our own heads, we were just like, this is going to be really interesting. I'm not really sure how this story is going to go. Not because we didn't feel like any of you couldn't pull it off, but it's just like, that's a really interesting challenge. We're really looking forward to what comes out of it. And it was so great how surprising so many of the results were. Um, and I'm going to tell people for, for um, who might be, maybe have not gotten to this story yet, you know, L3 is obviously the star of the story and the other members of, of the Millennium Collective, as they are known. But uh, Treadwell might is probably going to steal your heart by the end of it. Um, Treadwell is amazing. Uh, and if you're like, Treadwell, Treadwell, I've been watching The Mandalorian and I heard the word Treadwell, um, you know. Yes, I immediately DM Tom. I was like, Tom, <laughs> did you see the latest episode of The Mandalorian? Did you see who was who was grilling the, the crate dragon meat? Did you see? It was Treadwell. Did you know that that was Treadwell? And he was like, yes, I know. We were just freaking out over DMs great. and it was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it was it, it, it was a lot of fun, uh, and it was it was a uh, uh, it's it's a really cool story. And your story also, uh, you know, I mentioned yesterday, Jason Fry wrote the longest story in the anthology by words. Catherine Valenti's story about the space log takes place over the longest amount of time in Star Wars in billions of years, but your story, Brittany, takes place over the longest amount of time if we just isolated to how much of the movie The Empire Strikes Back occurs during your story. Um, Almost half the movie, which when it came to figuring out where does your story go in the anthology, um, might have been the single most difficult story to place because you're like, well, it could go like right next to Django's story, you know, in the first 40%. Mm -hmm. It could go at the very end. It could be like the second to last story, or it could be anywhere else in between. Um, so yours was a bunch of yeah I thought y'all were gonna break it up into pieces and be like part one part two part three and just have it like just sprinkled throughout like some seasoning like here you go that actually might have been an easier idea <laughs> <laughs> all right next time I'll let y'all know ahead of time think of that. Uh, but anyway um so now that we kind of have some grounding with all of the stories I want to kind of step back and ask some questions you know the larger group and I actually want to start with one um, that is you've all you all touched on a little bit, um, but I, I, I'm interested to hear a bit more because this is for all of you your first time um, stepping officially into the Star Wars galaxy. And so I want to know a bit more about what was that experience like for you, um, and was there anything surprising about the process or about that that you you found over the course of developing this story with us? Um, I'm, I'm always curious to hear about this, obviously from from authors who are, are coming into Star Wars officially for the first time. I mean, so you, you talked about it here and there, but I'm interested to hear if, if people have other things that surprise them or sort of notable moments where they're like, wow, you know, I'm doing this thing. Um, and uh, just for the interest of how, uh, Django, I'll start with you, but obviously I'm, I'm sure. sure. You're on every um, something surprised me. Um, I mean, it's, it feels like a lot of pressure, um, which, you know, obviously it's it's a little different when you're writing something in a universe that has this many fans, you know, and I, I as a sort of awful nitpicky world building person myself, and, you know, I'm like the worst nerd in this way. So, like, I feel the need to be true to my nerd roots and, like, make sure little details are right. So, I spent a lot of time Googling and like reading Wikipedia and stuff like that, um, which is like not actually required. I'm not sure anyone notices these things, but me, um, but uh, that's kind of fun to be honest. Um, I'm not sure what I, I'm trying to think what would surprise me. I mean, working with Tom and the, the people there was great. I guess what, what came back in terms of you know, there's a point in the process where like, okay, we're sending this to Lucasfilm to get their like, 
you know, if, if the story is okay with them. And what came back from them was not the kind of complaints I was expecting. <laughs> there were like some very minor things, but like some people there very, clearly have a very good grip on the canon and they're like, you can do the story however you want, but like, this has to be this way. And I'm like, oh, okay. The, I think we talked about like tie, TIE fighter pilot life support systems. Yeah, stuff listen, like that. When, you, when you open up the can of worms that is talking about um, how, how ships and tech work in technology, right. there's a lot of stuff under the hood there. Because most stories, some, it never makes it into, no one will ever really know. Well, but the moment you crack that, that door open just a little bit. Um, somebody's writing the like illustrated technical manual to Star Wars, right? That, which I obviously have somewhere. Yeah. Um, there are there are but, Haynes car manual type books for right, type and so so it was that kind of stuff that that we ended up going back and forth on, which is actually great. Like you know, as as the super nerd, that's kind of my jam. You got what you wish for. Uh, what about the rest I mean, of you guys? Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying. So anybody else had a surprising thing, or or is something else just about their experience of of joining Star Wars officially? Can I just I just want to. Um agree with what Lydia was saying before is that I felt an overwhelming uh, pressure and burden because <laughs> I was like you know like you you're a fan and then you know and I I'm so, like I'm a fan like I'm like I'm trying to get my kids look watch it 500 times with me I don't understand why you don't like it as much as I do <laughs> and so then to me I was just like this is this is so huge I, I didn't want to mess it up you know, even though in my head, I was like, well, I'm going to bring a new character. I'm going to bring new characters in and they're going to be interacting. But it was the intensity also of the time of when we were writing it. Mm -hmm. And so I really kind of hit me because, you know, we're at home and I was just like, there was uprising happening right outside my door. And I felt that I felt that energy also when I was writing the story. I was just like, how how can I write about this? You know, my future feels so uncertain <laughs> right now. And I felt that also when I'm watching Empire Strikes Back, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was that feeling of like, yeah, getting it right, but also getting the, that, the, the intensity of, of that, of living there, of living in this space of, of, of rebels, of, of alliances, of all that stuff, but just getting it of what that looks like for a young person who's trying to navigate her, her life in that, in there, in that realm. You know, um, I don't know, surprising. It was surprising in the sense that it was daunting. Yeah, <laughs> and I was freaking totally. out most of the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for me, I just loved like delving into the casinos. There, I didn't realize there were multiple casinos in Cloud City. And I went down the, the rabbit hole, the Royal Casino, and just the, everything from like the, like the games they played and the checkerboard dance floor it was just it was really great just putting those little details into the story i i didn't realize cloud city was so huge even though tom you told me there weren't like, like i think i had like a bunch of gangsters and stuff you're like no call them call them something different <laughs> that, that's actually it's interesting you bring that up. i was going to bring this up later but as we're talking about this in particular for um you know for lillian and rob and, and karen mm -hmm. people who spent most of your story is, is on bestman um, it's an interesting thing that all of you had to do a little bit of work in terms of helping to flesh out Cloud City, which if you really think about Cloud City in the movie, we see like basically three rooms, the yeah. carbonite chamber and like a yeah. dining hall and a hallway. So it, in some ways it almost doesn't feel as real a place as like when we're on Hoth yeah. or, or even when you're in, on the Death Star and you spend all that time running around it in the first film. Uh, and so we had to answer questions like actually Cloud City is not a wretched hive of scum and villainy. Like, it, it, <laughs> like it's like, oh, well, Lando runs the place, so like wretched, you know, like, but it's actually not. And so, you know, while there are some places, it's a it's a real lived in place and William, your story gets into it. Actually, all your stories get into a bit. There are, you know, uh, places of, 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 you know, where life is different on Cloud City. It is not like a, you know, a hive. It's not of a crime den. <laughs> uh, so that was something that, and I think it was one of those hive mind things where like, I think in all of your stories at one point we had to circle and be like, actually, no, it's not, it's not like the cantina on, uh, on Tattoo. Um, you know, um, it's also not a tourist destination, which is another one of those fun things. Right, I'm, right. I'm curious, right. You wrote that. I'm, I'm curious, where did you get, where did the impression for you come from that Bespin might be a tourist destination? Because it was in all three manuscripts. I remember this. I remember Alex, one of my dear coworkers being like, 
why there's tourists here the cloud city is not a tourist place right i'm like no 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 it's not a tourist place I think I read a Christmas story on Bespin where Lando took like <laughs> some kids and they went Christmas shopping. And so that's probably where I got my- yeah, that, That's all right, that perfectly, perfectly yeah. reasonable. Yeah, I, I, mean, I forget where I found that. I think I found it on like, I found it somewhere on the internet. I just saw some kind of reference. To it's like, out there, Tom. We all did it. Okay. It's, it's out there. We all, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we all did it. Yeah, we all did it. I mean, it also things. has that vibe. Like anywhere that has a casino, tourists yeah, are going to go there. Like right. that's the vibe. Like, that's true. Who wouldn't want to go to like, how could it not be a tourist destination? It's so, I mean, in the movie, it's beautiful. And it's like a city on a gas giant. It yeah. can't be common. No, uh, it's definitely, definitely, definitely has that aesthetic. Um, but no, it's, you know, um, the glitz and the glamour uh, as we come to find it in many of your stories is, is actually part of the tool that Lando uses, obviously, to hopefully entice people to come to make deals with him for stuff. You know, Emissaries, like, not criminals. We exactly. Uh, uh, but you I know, I we understand. Same note. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Emma, a funny thing. Emissaries, just... not criminals. <laughs> yeah. But as we find in William's story, there are there are there are some shady <laughs> characters, some criminal types that will show up on Bestman. You know, it's it is Star Wars. They're definitely going to be gangsters and bounty hunters everywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, I got us a little off track. Was did anything else jump out to anyone as surprising about their process? Um, I mean, I, I think the thing that was most surprising to me was the emotional roller coaster of it, because it's like it, it's the sheer joy of like being led over to like the coolest sandbox in the world and being like, you can play with all of these toys. But then sitting down and just the abject terror of being like, oh, my God, not only do I not really know how these toys technically work, but people are going to be standing and judging me based on how I play with these toys. <laughs> And so it gets real scary real quick. And uh, th there was definitely, and, and I mean, granted, I do this a lot uh, with my own writing, but like th there, there was definitely a moment of paralysis where I almost sent you guys an email like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I can't do this, give it to someone else. But um, yeah, no, it was just, uh, it, it, was, it was completely and utterly terrifying. And then I think when, uh, when Liz Schaefer told me, okay, we're gonna send it over to Lucasfilm now for approval, I'm like, ooh, you just made it worse. <laughs> But um, uh, but 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 we're not back. that scary. We're, I promise everyone, it's not nearly as scary. No, 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 it's not. We're, not we're to back to the sheer things. joy. Everything is yeah. fine now. But uh, yeah, no, it was uh, it, it was a fun emotional process. Lots of emotions. Yeah, uh, yeah that's I, great, Brittany. I think I was surprised at how much they let me do. Like, I once I once I was like, all right, I'm in this. I'm doing it. Yolo. We gotta we gotta get this story written. We gotta get it sent in. Um, and I sent it and uh, Elizabeth gave me her notes and uh, you gave your notes, Tom. And then y'all were like, all right, we're sending it to Lucasfilm. I was like, all right, they're going to send it back. All the dialogue's going to be cut. All the characters are going to be cut. It's going to be like two sentences left that are still from the original movie. And they were like, sorry, you got to write this whole thing again. And I was like, all right, bet. If that's what it is, then that's what it is. And uh, they actually let me keep a lot of stuff. Uh, and I was, I was like you too, Django. I was doing like all of this research. I have like, I use Scrivener to write. So in my Scrivener short story doc, I have like the schematics of the Millennium Falcon. So I can know exactly where everybody was going, like figuring out like, okay, so they're here and this is what's happening. And like, okay, so what is this called? What is that called? I have like the Star Wars vehicles book. I was going through that. I kept like rewatching the scenes of Empire. I rewatched some of Solo. I like, I found the novelization of Solo so I could read the ending of that and think, I was like, all right, I'm good. I'm ready. I'm prepped. I'm good. They still going to delete my whole story, but that's okay. And then they didn't, and they didn't have a whole lot of notes. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm Gucci now. Can't nobody tell me nothing. So <laughs> this, this dear writers and readers and uh, is why we do things like um, uh, initial pitches and outlines so that we do not have to do that. That sort of thing. That, that's part of removing some of that fear. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, not, the way my anxiety set up, it doesn't matter how much prep we did. It just, it, <laughs> I knew they I were going to delete my whole story. <laughs> uh, totally. The same thing. I was totally afraid they were going to be like, you can't do that. You can't say that. You can't say that either. And they were just going to be like, no, no, maybe, no, do this over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I did the same thing that you guys did. I was like, I like went to Wikipedia. I was like reading through all this stuff and I'm like, I'm going to find where this guy shows up in every single Star Wars book that has ever been published in the world. And I did because I needed to find out. I'm like, I have to inhabit this guy's voice. I don't know what kind of voice he has, or at least I didn't know enough, right? So I had to like do all that stuff. And I was like, oh my God, am I going to get it right? 
and make sure that I got like all the, the details right about his hydraulics and oops, this came off. Um, he's not treating people right now though, he's on vacation. So anyway, it was just really, just constantly wondering like, um, because of the huge fandom, like, oh my God, what are they going to think? What are they going to like, you know, are they gonna nitpick this? Are they gonna be like, oh, is this okay or not? So anyway, a lot of the same sort of highs and lows, wow. I think, through the year. I'm so glad we could all hang out and have this kind of group group <laughs> moment together. Um, and the great thing is you all came through it and you all wrote these absolutely amazing stories. These absolutely amazing stories that that help bring new elements, new voices, new perspectives, new characters, new identities to this thing that we have all loved for most of us for as long as we can actually remember and you know all the way back to to 1980 so you all came through it and did wonderfully and it was so great uh and it, and it was exciting to be on the other side of the uh, uh other side of the track track changes comments um for, for these stories um something i'm curious about and this actually um it kind of covers all your stories um is that all of you um obviously you know l337 um is not ordinary but um your story does contain Brittany, a lot of ordinary characters who are existing in Star Wars inside this extraordinary galaxy where there's constantly extraordinary circumstances. So within their story heavens and all of the other characters from Amara Kell, uh, you know, to Jalen, to even Wilro Hood, who, you know, has this cult of, of, of personality and cult of following in terms of his kind of meta status as a Star Wars character, but he's essentially an ordinary character. So was there something specific that drew all of you to wanting to write an ordinary character in Star Wars? And is there something about Star Wars that makes writing ordinary characters particularly attractive? Um, and uh, I mean, it, um, anybody who, who would like to start could start. Because um, they're all, obviously, they're all, a lot of them are ordinary, but they're all very different. They're droids and pilots, they have, you know, every, every walk of life, uh, yeah. you know, roughly. Yeah, I think for me, the reason why I wanted to write just like an ordinary person, because when you think about it, when we were watching uh, Empire, you know, it's almost like we were watching it and we were affected by it. So I just wanted to write just an ordinary character who was going to be deeply, deeply affected by what they saw um, for me on Bespin. So that's one of the reasons why, because 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 some of the themes that we have in Empire, you know, fighting against tyranny and totalitarianism is like, I wanted to have that effect, the same effect that we as viewers have. I wanted one of the character, I wanted that to also happen for Jalen too. I think for me, it's often when I see a movie with a world as sort of interesting and detailed as the Star Wars world is, I always come away with these questions of like, what are these people's lives like, right? So for me in this story, it was the TIE Fighters, but like that was part of what I loved about the first uh, certain point of view book when I, when I read it is like, you know, you watch the first movie and you're like, what are the Jawas, like, what do they do when they're not, you know, stealing droids from Luke Skywalker or, or <laughs> for Luke Skywalker or whatever? Um, you know, what, what, are, what are the guys in the cantina do the rest of the time, right? You know, because Star Wars gives us this such a rich world it um, it kind of makes me ask these questions because there's all these little details that make you think, wait, what is that thing? Wait, turn back, turn the camera around. And so it's a chance to do that. I, I mean, I feel the same way. And also it's just, um, I don't know, like I feel like it's, when we when we watch Empire Strikes Back, we already know that they're going to be big deals, like Princess Leia and and their Luke. They're like they're big, right? They're larger than life already. And I'm and to me, I'm just I wanted to write someone who maybe is at the beginning at, of her journey of becoming great, <laughs> you know, just at the start of like making these decisions that will affect her life in a way that she didn't even think. Like she thought. This is going to be the path that's going to get me to where I want to go, and this is the this is actually the path I need to go. And so then I'm always I'm super I don't know interested in like yeah like like you said like the the bartenders who's serving drinks who's you know who's manning the the stores who's you know selling capes like I want to know what they're doing because I'm feeling like they're not just selling capes they're doing a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> 
And so, yeah, so that was the reason why I wanted to kind of write about this kind of like, you know, sort of ordinary, but she wants to be extraordinary. <laughs> I kind of feel like I, uh... You know, you know, obviously my first attraction to Will Rowhood was like, oh, he's the ice cream maker guy and I like ice cream and, you know, boom, easy enough. But, uh, you know, when, when I took it a little bit further and I sat down and I looked at like, okay, here's Cloud City. This guy obviously works there. He's an employee in this place that is sort of like feels somewhat opulent. And, you know, so there's a lot of rich people there. And then there are the people who work there who probably aren't as well compensated and who are probably sort of, you know, not being treated as well and, and getting access to that lifestyle. And, and that's, that's right in my wheelhouse. That's the kind of stuff I love to write about and love to read about. So I felt really lucky then. Cause I was like, Oh man, like this will be good because, because, because there's a comfort level for me now. And it, it's also a testament to j just such what an incredible canvas star Wars is that you can, that you can really sort of drill down and find these little stories where you didn't expect them, but, but, but there's so much opportunity in the storytelling. Uh, from a sort of practical writer's standpoint, also writing about an ordinary person who is not one of these named characters that we know is kind of freeing. You know, you have a lot more, you know, places you can go and, and maybe, you know, we were all talking about the pressure. And so maybe it takes a little bit of that pressure off if we're not like, I'm going to write Boba Fett or I'm going to write Luke Skywalker. Yeah. It's like, this is, this is my character that I'm making up. And so nobody's going to gonna set me on fire if I don't do it perfectly. Yes. And until, as as Lydia um, so eloquently put it earlier, you you accidentally start writing lots yeah. of dial. You start writing for a character who runs into Luke Skywalker. I'm actually reminded, Lydia, um, your your fellow um, contributor, um, Amy Radcliffe, who was with us um, early in the week, talked about she basically did a similar thing where she's writing a character who starts talking to Han Solo. And she's like, I'm writing dialogue for on solo i'm writing dialogue for you know basically harrison ford like i didn't mean to do this and now i'm in it and there's there's no way out but through and so we're just gonna make it happen it's really good by the way um uh it's really good uh but uh i i can understand that that sentiment Django, um and that idea of um it, it does give you this extra layer um to 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 explore star wars um in in, in a way that that might take some of that pressure off uh, yeah, I was I was pretty nervous about um, knowing that like if if this wasn't if I didn't do this the right way, or rather I should say if two one B doesn't do his job the well, then the entire fate of the Star Wars universe, like the next movie, would have been completely different. And you know, it it occurred to me that obviously he's not only is he just getting like this artificial hand, but this is like a huge parallel between him and his father. Of course, his father's situation when he was getting, you know, these artificial limbs and stuff like that was just one just wrought of like so much pain and anguish. And, and Luke has his own set of pain and anguish, but here is, you know, a, a healthcare provider who actually can step in and maybe turn the situation in a, in a certain direction. And so it was just, it felt very sort of weighty at the time, but I also, you know, um, I like the idea that there was just this ordinary person of this ordinary character who um, who had the ability, um, maybe didn't realize it at the time, but had the ability to really um, change the trajectory of an entire, you know, of an entire universe. So yeah, there's a lot, sometimes they have a lot of power. They may, maybe don't know it. And it was fun to explore that. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I'm interested to hear, because we, we talked about this a little bit, I'm interested to hear more about each of your um, relationships to Empire as a film or as an experience and, and, and how that affected approaching your story. But also, so many of you all talked about, obviously, rewatching so many parts of it, you know, revisiting it. Did anything jump out to you about Empire this fifth, 10th, 20th, you know, 50th time experience either related specifically to your character or your story or just like something about the movie because I'm sure um, that that might've happened for you. Um, uh, did it yet. Um, and while, while you're all, I'll give you a, a second to think of while you're thinking about that, um, uh, I noticed there was a question in the chat from Bill. Um, the 2-1-B in Lydia's story is indeed the, the same 2-1-B, right Lydia from uh, earlier uh, yeah. in the book. It's the same 2-1-B, um, but it's just the scene from the end of the movie. Correct. So it is the same 2-1-B from Hoth, and he even has a, a very um, funny remark where he informs 
uh, Luke that he is, you know, worried, he is worried that Luke is sort of becoming a rather frequent patient of his um, after having helped treat him uh, from his uh, wampa wounds and uh, his mm -hmm. exposure to ice in the, in the uh, hot. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, so I was just interested again about like your relationship to Empire and did anything surprise you having gone back to this this tome, this this piece of, of, uh, of media that's been around for so long? Um, I mean, actually, you were completely right when you said that there's just not a lot of sort of like interiors in Cloud City. Nope. <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, I'm watching it. I'm like, oh, man, like, this is my moment to shine, like, like, as we're approaching the scene. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get this story down in the next 10 minutes. And then after like, they leave Cloud City, I'm like, oh, no, I have to figure this out now. It has um, excellent but, crown molding, though. They have really good beautiful. crown molding. It does. No expense. It does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like like some of the details are cool but 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 then it was just sort of like this fun challenge of like okay cool now i have to take like that little bit and just sort of extrapolate it out i think this must have been my first time watching empire on my like big fancy new tv mm -hmm. which is not actually that new it's like five years old but I, I think it's been a while since i watched empire and so i'm watching it in this like really high def you know version from disney plus or whatever and um there's lots of little bits and pieces you notice that, you know, there's little bits of special effects that don't line up, but there's also all these little bits of, um, of detail on the props, like the, like you were talking about the crown molding and made me think of it. There's like, there's so many good pieces in that. Mm -hmm. I, um, I realized how much time they spend on the Falcon. Um, like it's just, they're on Hoth and then they're just on the Falcon and then Cloud City and then they're back on the Falcon and then they're with the fleet. Uh, and also it just really stood out to me um, as I rewatched Empire and kept rewatching all the Falcon scenes. We really have no idea where the hallways, like how the hallways work in the Falcon and like how you <laughs> actually get to the cockpit, like where is anything? Like you just see people walk out of a hallway and suddenly it's like, oh, we're in the engine room. And then they walk out of a hallway and suddenly they're in the cockpit and it's like, I they walk down the gangplank. It's like, I don't know, where, I didn't know where anything actually was. And it didn't matter how many times I watched the scenes over and over again, or how many other movies featuring the Millennium Falcon I watched. I just, we just don't know. They just walk down these infinite hallways and appear places. And it's like, oh, okay, cool, thanks. Brittany, I wanna see your map. Like, right. I really want to see it because I, I, I don't know exactly what you mean. I'm just like, there's the round part and then right. there's a place where they hide everything. But I was like, mm -hmm. how does it all connect? I would like to I, know. I was like, okay, I was like, all right. So I got to figure out like, when are they doing this? Like where, because you also have to describe it. You have to paint a picture. And I wanted to write a story that someone who wasn't extremely familiar with the movie could still enjoy. So I wanted to make sure that I was like very specific and very clear about where everybody was at any given moment. Um, and also because we're only seeing all the action from the cams that are placed throughout the Falcon because L3, uh, V5T and ED4 can't actually, you know, they're not there. They're just inside, literally inside the computer. Um, so I just needed, I was trying to orient where they are, how long it takes people to get places, um, where, you know, people could hide if they needed to. Um, yeah, and it just didn't, the movie didn't help me at all. I was like, this will be my saving grace. And it was like, <laughs> nope, you played yourself. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> it is true, it is true. And you're not the first person to say that. And I think some of that goes to, um, and this is true, it's very much true of the middle part of the movie. I'm sure, Django, that you ran into this for your story. But it's also true of the Cloud City moments that don't, that aren't just like, Han and Leia in a room alone, and there is there basically not anyone else in Cloud City or you know in the Carbonite Chamber when it's just Luke and Vader. But so many of the scenes in Empire are over like that. They are so quick. There's so many short scenes. It's and such wondering, a tight movie. Yeah, I'm wondering did that did that create any challenge for him, or did you find the fact that like the scenes where you would get a glimpse of either your character or where your character was if you're using some of the original characters who don't necessarily have like an exact, that's my analog right there. Did you find that more freeing? Did that create more challenge um, for you? Um, Cause that was the thing when we got to the middle, the middle portion, I um, mean, we were looking at the stories there is like, oh my gosh, it's like the, 
the emperor's got his scene and then yoda and then we're back on this ship and then we're with the space log and we're back to yoda and we're back over here and you're like what it's going you know it's, it's all tight it's all impeccably edited together but all of those scenes are very staccato one after each other and that kind of continues in parts well, it, it kind of speaks to how rich it is like think how much extended universe content and all these books and stuff over the years has come out of that one scene where Darth Vader talks to the bounty hunters mm -hmm. that's like literally 30 seconds long or something, maybe 60 seconds. You know, he tells them no disintegrations, right? Like that scene has spawned so much, you know, and that the whole movie's like that. Yeah, I think it, it, at the beginning, I was a little like, oh my God, there's like seconds where 2-1-B is in here or like the FX droid. I'm like, just seconds. And I have to figure out how to make all of this happen and, and still fit, you know, with the movie. So I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot. I just had like a couple of, you know, seconds at all. And um, in some ways I think it was actually freeing cause I could do more um, with that and fit stuff in before and after, you know, certain, certain parts. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I rewound like those <laughs> like, that, like 50 times going like zip and be like, oh, that, that was it. Oh, it's over. <laughs> like pause. And I'm just like, okay, <laughs> freeze frame, <laughs> like, <laughs> capture. And I'm like, uh, and, you know, I didn't have a whole lot, but it, I, in some ways it's not a bad thing. Yeah. But there was a lot, I mean, what was cool was like, you know, as everybody were doing our research, but then you see a lot of people who have, who create these illustrations of what Cloud City would look like. And I'm like, okay. And I, and that was when I was like, trying to zoom in <laughs> like do you see like what are people wearing or any little anything that I could like kind of zoom in and try to try to see what how things look like you know um but it was just kind of fun I don't I don't know I loved it I just loved like what you know Wikipedia I'm just like what else what fandoms I don't care just give me all the information <laughs> What something, um, sorry, I was just distracted ever so slightly by a, a question from anonymous attendee, which is about Cloud City. And since we're talking about it, I'm gonna pull it in, which was just, was there anything across the stories that conflicted regarding the layout and environment of Cloud City since the authors had more room to build out? Um, not really. Um, one of the nice things about Cloud City is, you know, when you do see the wide shots of it, it's a pretty big place. Like it is not tiny, like it is a city. It is Cloud City, mm -hmm. it's not Cloud you know, town. It's not cloud like <laughs> neighborhood. It is city. So that gives you the freedom to be able to actually build out quite a, a wide breadth of spaces. And there, you know, there we know from the film that there are like lots of different landing and launch pads from which people, so it's a big place. So not really, it really just came down to making sure that, you know, there wasn't, that it wasn't, again, the, the cantina again and a, a wretched hide of scum and villainy and it's just like a, like a pirate outpost or, you know, um, like nowhere from, uh, from the, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy's type films. It's not, not a place like that. But so no, not really. Um, no postcards. No, no postcards. <laughs> uh, no postcards. Um, and you all actually did something very interesting on the Bespin side where so many of you were actually exploring very specific and different parts of Bespin that they just, they actually all complemented each other rather nicely. Um, just because you're not all in the same places, like Jalen's character, Jalen is nowhere near where um, uh, Isabella is. Like they just are not in the same place in Cloud City, um, and so it actually just helps enrich it and make that place feel more lived in yeah. and real. Um, the way that all these stories layer, um, and uh, Alexander Freed's story, which takes place there, actually traverses a wide swath of it. And even though he does not specifically mention the same places that your stories take place in, you can actually almost chart like, yeah, this feels like all those same places. So mm. um, thank you for the question, Anas Infinity. But uh, no, we actually didn't have any, any issues with that, which is nice. Um, uh, I'm curious about um, uh, oh, the best dogs. <laughs> oh, dogs, dogs are great. Oh, hello dogs. Dogs are <laughs> Thank you, Lydia, for blessing us with some dogs. My cat, my cat interns just refused to show up for any of these this three days. So uh, this is a treat that we actually get some. I really wanted to see Lando, though. He's my favorite. I know. Lando, um, uh, for those who don't know, I have a, a cat intern. His name is Lando, um, but he refuses to appear on mm. camera. I don't know if he didn't, you know, we didn't uh, negotiate his fee or something like that. Um, but uh, I, I will post some pictures on Twitter of, of Lando as a constellation later. Um, okay, what I'm interested to talk about, because this um, empire is all about basically like the fulcrum of Star Wars, particularly obviously the original, it's the fulcrum point. It's the point where all of the personal journeys um, 
are changed by like the larger um, experiences and the larger fallout from the film and personal journeys or choices are forced to be made within those personal journeys, even if maybe characters weren't ready for it. And in almost, pretty much all your stories, that's kind of something that you're either dealing with directly, you know, Amara Kel has all these rules, but this is the story where all those rules get challenged and she's forced to reckon with them. Lydia, your character 2-1-B isn't uh, themselves dealing with that, but obviously Luke Skywalker is, and so your mm -hmm. character is working through that. And of course, all the characters on Cloud City are mm -hmm. working on their own dreams and working on their own stories. And then, oh, by the way, Darth Vader shows up and just is like, oh yeah, this place that is like an oasis. Um, yeah, no more and creates all this tumult. So interested to hear from people talking about how those tumultuous moments within your own stories create these kind of moments of purpose and clarity for your characters. And I have to imagine that was probably a helpful driving force. I mean, we talked about kind of the anxiety of of cracking your stories, but I have to imagine that that was kind of a helpful guiding light, right? That you have this, it's all gonna go wrong. And as storytellers, isn't that the best thing when you have a moment in a story where it's all gonna go wrong? Um, Lillian, yeah, I, think oh, I'm sorry, Karen. I was no, I, I was gonna, no, I was gonna say me and Rob had it kind of good because pretty much Lando saying the garrison was coming, get off Cloud City. <laughs> that sort of helped me a lot to figure out my my turning point of where my character needed to do so that was that was very helpful thanks lando for getting the pa system telling us to get out see he's out lando's very helpful lando's yes very helpful. Um, lily lillian what about yours because your your story was actually your story inspired this particular question because your character is on this very specific journey and has this very you know specific through line of this is what i'm gonna do this is the choice i'm gonna make mm. and then the circumstances on cloud city so directly impact that choice. Yeah, I mean, um, Isabella, she, you know, she's been studying all the the bounty hunters. Like that's what she's been doing while she's been living at Cloud in Cloud City, and um, and she knows the one person that's gonna change her life if she all she has to do is meet Boba Fett. If everything's gonna change for her. Boba Fett is gonna take her under her wing, and they're gonna do the thing together. <laughs> oh. And so that's what she was, you know, at mindset <laughs> goals. <laughs> And so, um, you know, and she's kind of blinded by this, the, this uh, imaginary fantasy kind of goal that she has that if all she has to do is meet him and everything will, all, her life will change for the better, you know? And um, so I love that idea because <laughs> you know, it's not gonna go well. <laughs> no. I think we actually wrote in the very first draft of your story when you have a line that's basically, oh, if I can just meet Boba Fett, all my problems are solved. I think we actually wrote like, you sweet summer child. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you did. You, I was cracking up. <laughs> uh, but it's great. It's a great moment. It's great because, you know, not every character in Star Wars knows who Boba Fett is. Not every, you know, people in Star Wars have not seen Star Wars necessarily. That's so, true. Uh, that's right. That, that's and great. I don't know. I mean, everyone, when we watched um, Empire Strikes Back, like, that was like, Boba Fett was like, well, how long was he on? It? Like, not long, you know? No, like <laughs> and two, then it was just like, for everyone felt, you know, was like both at everyone. Like, I just remember that I, and um, when I was a kid. And so, yeah, I wanted, I wanted Isabella to be that obsessed as well. <laughs> That's really good. Um, uh, Rob, there's a Q&A question for you that uh, I want you to answer. I don't want you to spoil it entirely. Mm -hmm. though, but I think you sure. can. Okay. Which is, this is from Michael. Uh, thank you, Michael, for submitting. He says, can you talk about the story of called Do on Batu, which Batu is obviously, you know, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Um, and he's just interested about if you could talk a little bit about the connection to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge and why you chose to include Batu as part of your story. Yes, uh, this this was a lot of a deep thought and consideration. Um, I went to Galaxy's Edge in February and I liked it. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. No, so seriously, it was like I was writing the story and I, kn I knew Will Rowe had to go somewhere um, or, or be, be aiming for some kind of goal. And I was like, oh man, Batu was cool. Yeah, I'm just gonna put that in there. <laughs> um, which, which literally when I was there, I was like, and, and like popping around and checking out all the cool stuff. And I made like one of the little BB-8 droids with my daughter. And at one point I did think, I was like, oh, I wonder if I should call Tom and see if I can get some cool like backdoor access here. Um, I am but... I am honored and touched that you believe I have such power. Does <laughs> <laughs> that actually work? <laughs> I, 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 I am honored and touched by that. Um, 
I you you greatly overestimate my power. Um, <laughs> to reverse to inverse an actual Star Wars line, you greatly overestimate. Um, uh, but uh, that that is great. So yes, that's why. Um, um, and it's great. Sometimes you know, sometimes you need a, a Star Wars planet. Sometimes you just need a name, and it you know, um, functionally sometimes does not totally matter which one it is. So it's always nice to be able to use one that has some resonance. Yeah, well, I mean, it was also kind. Of, it's sort of like uh, like an outposty kind of like you know out of the way place. So it just it it, it like it was just it was a great moment where it was like, oh, this totally fits. Exactly, um, and we know that Batu is around. Batu has been you know is a part of you know Star Wars you know backwards and forwards. So it it make, makes good sense. And I think as you'll find as you read the story that like yeah, uh, once you sort of find out exactly how Batu fits in in terms of why he might want to go there, why the phrase do to do on Batu is involved. Um, uh, it uh, it makes a lot of sense. No, I'm sorry, Bill. I cannot get everyone VIP access to Galaxy's Edge um, <laughs> during pandemics or not during pandemics. <laughs> I don't, don't, once, once, once again, I don't have that. Power. I wish I did. Um, I would take everybody. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, I want to give everyone a chance because this project has been is obviously such a labor of love for everyone involved, and you know involves so many people uh, and so many stories. I want to give everyone a chance to tell me what your favorite moment in this anthology is, either from your own story or another story that you've read or one of the other stories that you maybe heard about um, or just any moment in, in, in general about the process. Um, and if you're if the thing you wanna reference is like a super spoiler for, for a story, you can find a way to be slightly oblique about it. But uh, yeah, I'm curious to hear um, what what is your favorite thing about this anthology um, or favorite, Big or small. It could be a single sentence that you wrote. It could be a single thing someone else dropped in, or it could be, you know, some larger, some larger thing. Um, and uh, I'm not going to call on anyone because I feel like this is a thing someone knows. So if someone's gone. All right, great. Brittany's, Brittany's going. So Brittany, you can go first. Um, one thing I really love is how many queer people are in the book. Like, it's just like I would be reading a story and I would be like, they'd be like, oh, this main character is a woman. And it'd be like, oh, I love this hot woman. Or it'd be a guy. And it's like, oh, this dude is so hot. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, my fellow queers, welcome to Star Wars. I love you. Keep coming, keep bringing them to me. Keep, I just want all of them, all of my sweet children, all of my, my, my queer siblings, just let's just go. And I, I didn't. I didn't have any queer people in my story. Uh, we'll see if I can get that. Yeah, it, I just didn't. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, it really, um, so when Elizabeth was like, oh yeah, we call this gays in space. Like this is the, the like subtitle of this anthology. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, and, but to see it, like to see it really actualized and to see that this really is like, it's just, Queers in space everywhere. It's so beautiful to me. I just love it so much. <laughs> I mean, I I feel bad because I can only reference my own story because I haven't actually gotten a copy of this yet. This I is, think it's this like is... wending its way through the postal service. It, it, um, I mean, you wrote about how the, the Navy post loses your mail. It's true, is, right? That's like, um, but uh, from my story, one of my favorite bits was uh, doing some non swear word swearing and trying mm -hmm. to figure out these are you know soldiers and pilots and they're obviously going to be foul mouthed and um you know trying to figure out how to get that in there um there's some there's some fun ones i'm surprised they let us keep there there, there are a couple of very fun um we'll call them profanities uh in in your story that that again yes are indicative of the type of character which is fun. It, that's one of those fun challenges is you know star wars for all that is star wars is an adult but it's also all ages, so you know, mm -hmm. swearing and mm -hmm. or or exclaiming in a in a profane way when it when it makes sense, you can do, but you have to be creative about. Um, anyone else have a favorite moment? Favorite? Anything? Okay. Oh, go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Go I'm kind of a, I'm kind of obsessed with Tooth and Claw by Michael Kogue. Michael Kogi's story, the, uh, the mosque story. Yes. <laughs> I'm not gonna spoil anything, but I literally like gas when I figured out the character reveal. I was like, oh, I didn't see that coming. So that was fun. That is excellent. I'm glad you mentioned that one. That that was I and I didn't know that either because ah. his, his his initial sort of um his initial sort of pitch for it was oh I'd like to write a story about Bosk. Um and I want to write a story about Bosk before the, the actual scene, the, the bounty hunter scene. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna set it. He's doing something else. He's on another job and he gets called to that. So I said, okay. And so that's Got approved and he started to put the store together and then yes, Karen, 
that moment happens. That thing happens. <laughs> what? I was like, what's happening? <laughs> and it's a, it is it was amazing. It's amazing. I'm so glad you mentioned that. It's a great story. Um, and Michael will so appreciate you, you mentioning that's that. My, that's my yeah, it. that's my favorite so far. It changes every day, but that yeah. one tonight. Because we had we had many of the same conversations. I had many of the same conversations with him that I, we had tonight with him being like, I, I hope I get to do this. Like I hope this stays in. Like I hope we can make this happen. Uh, and he did. Um, really? Um, I think um, I I also haven't gotten my copy yet, so I want to sit down and, and I, I, I was looking the, for it today. I was like, is it here? Oh. I know the mail service has been very busy with some very important things, and I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the focus, uh, but also I sent these so long ago. Uh, no, no. So, um, but but I, what I wanted to say is that it, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, is that I really it's. I think I mentioned it on Twitter too, is that I'm really, really happy that I get to do this with Daniel Jose Older and Marco Shiro and Zoraida Cordova, who, you know, it's like the Latino, Latinx crew, <laughs> Latinx Star, Star Wars crew. Like it was a big deal. Cause I felt like we were all, when, you know, when it was announced, cause you know, every, everything's under, you know, sworn of secrecy. And then when it's finally announced the table of contents, we were all just like, ah! like just screaming. Cause we were, we were part of it. And it was, I don't know. That to me was like, that's the biggest thing for me is like just being able to share this moment with those guys. Yeah, that was great. And anytime we could do a big story reveal is always so much fun because everyone gets to be super excited all at once about this <laughs> once if things get thrown at them. Um, yeah. You know, I will say, um, uh, so so I got the book. I, I, I The only stories I've read so far are the stories from from everyone here tonight. And and the thing that that really struck me that I thought was so great is that you know, they're all they're all set in the same universe and they're all sort of playing with the same sandbox of characters, but everyone's sort of voice and personality comes through so clearly. And, and that's really just kind of incredible. And um and and I wanna and I wanna make this really clear, really, really clear. Everyone wrote incredible stories. I'm not playing favorites, but I, I've got a thing for like quippy robots. So I mean, Brittany. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's the the new book I'm writing has a sarcastic robot in it. So I was like, yeah, yeah, we're on the same page with that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's just man, it was just such a pleasure to read j just sort of like this, this richness of, of 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 voices and the way it just really opens up the universe even more. Yeah, it's, it's great. And I mean, that's the that's the whole thing about. It. And we we talked about this uh, a few times where like, you know, when all of you came on board if any of you asked for guidance about like, well, what character could I do or who maybe is already taken, um, we would give you a list or we would give you some suggestions if you need help. But everybody basically just had free reign to pick their character because ultimately we wanted you all to tell not a Star Wars story, but we wanted you to tell your Star Wars story. And if you, you know, if we were just like, all right, Rob, you're writing this Stormtrooper and Karen, you're writing <laughs> Boba Fett. And there's like, you know, maybe we would have matched up some characters with some, uh, uh, authors who like felt an affinity there or, or really felt like they had something to say that was true to them themselves. But, you know, it, it totally works so much better this way. So um, I, I'm glad that you feel that way, Rob, because it definitely, it definitely came through as we were working on those stories because none of the stories feel the same. Just, they just don't because whether it gets down to tone, writing style, character identity, perspective, the themes, like there are lots of overlaps. And like I said, these hive mind moments where all of us as Star Wars nerds just kind of all make the same jokes about Han and Leia, <laughs> or, you know, uh, all make the same sort of remark about Boba Fett. Um, but in the end, all of these stories um, kind of distill themselves into the unique identity and voice of the, the authors that came. Uh, which is cool. Um, Lydia, did you have a, a favorite moment or anything that you you? That, uh, a couple, that I guess a, a couple. I'm. I know it's a little repetitive, but I just like was pretty um, psyched to see the the wealth and um, richness of authors on that front cover when it came out. I was like, oh my god, this is just incredible. I just felt really honored to be part of like these. You guys are amazing. It's really cool to be working with you. And then that agrees. Yeah, that agrees. <laughs> yeah, and then. Um, Second thing there's uh, was like when I decided I was going to write about 2-1-B is that the Lucasfilm people were like, yes, we wanted somebody to write this. And I was like, oh, they're happy about this. I'm like so excited. So that was really cool. And then the third thing, which I don't know, which I am geeking out about, but I don't know if anybody cares, is that I, my character got to work with Bacta, Bacta, you know, that like gel stuff that has magical healing properties. That's not actually magic. And they don't really explain the physiology of it, but 
Like we don't have that in my world. <laughs> and I was like, I get to use this. This is really cool. Like I, I wish I could have this in my actual medical practice, but I don't. So from like sort of a medical geeky standpoint, I really, really enjoyed that. So anyway. Star Wars technology is wonderful. And you know, you, you, you mentioned, you know, like, oh, you know, some people are from like, yes, right, this character. Everybody who works on Star Wars books behind the scenes on the team that I work on, friends at Lucasfilm, all the other publishing uh, people that I know, everyone, everybody has these sort of characters that they're like, they just love them. You know, they just, in the same way that everyone who loves Star Wars, like you just have that character. You're just like, I think I might be the only person in the world who loves this character, but this is my character and I love them yeah. forever and I want them to be in everything. Uh, and so when these stories show up like that, uh, you know, that a character, like I've always loved Jackson, the, the rabbit, not rabbit. And Kevin Scott is just like, hey, I want to do a Jackson story in a book that we're working on together. And I was just so excited because of course, I, you know, and so everyone behind the scenes has those kind of characters and 2-1-B is just, for whatever reason, 2-1-B is just one of those characters that people it's glom onto. Awesome. He's just so great. awesome. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I want to correct yeah. one thing. I misspoke. Okay. I said there were no queer characters in my book, in my story, and that's a lie because we all know Lando <laughs> Calrissian is pansexual. Landonis <laughs> Balthasar Calrissian is definitely His full pansexual. name. <laughs> His full name. His full government. Nice. Well done. <laughs> it's, great. it's a great name. It's a great name. Um, this this has been this has been really spectacular. Um, I've had so much fun um, chatting about this. Um, I think uh, you know we've been going for a, a good long while now, so I think we're gonna wrap up with with one more question. Um, but before I'm gonna give you all the question as I did the other nights, um, and I'll give you all a moment to think about it. I'll do one or two housekeeping things, and then we'll get to it. Um, this will be our last question, which is. You know, if if there was a, a from a certain point of view for for Return of the Jedi, and you were just you know five seconds, no one's holding you anything. There's no you know you know just just all hanging out, speaking and speaking uh, uh, as Star Wars fans. Who, who would you want to write for from a certain point of view, um, Return of the Jedi? So everyone think about that for a second, and I'm gonna just do a housekeeping thing or two, which is um, first of all, um, this will be our last question, but um, you know, and so after that we'll we'll be wrapping things up. Uh, so I want to thank, obviously, University Bookstore for three nights of amazing events. The fact that they um, partnered with us not to do this just one night, but for three nights and let me come back and chat with all of you and chat with all these authors was great. Um, and thank everyone who came to hang out, whether you came for just one night, whether you've been here all three nights. Um, gosh, that means just the absolute world to us. Um, um, you, uh, this, this book was a labor of love built during this crazy year. And so the fact that we finally got to share it with everyone and everyone seems to be embracing it um, and enjoying it means a lot to us. Um, and I apologize if this is now the third time you're going to have been hearing this if you've been here all three nights, but just to make sure, um, if you are enjoying from a certain point of view uh, The Empire Strikes Back, and if you're enjoying listening to all these wonderful first time Star Wars writers, you actually have a chance to listen to them talk about their stories in one more way, which is we put together a free author commentary podcast for you. Uh, and uh, actually today, we released the first 10 episodes. We're going to release them kind of in the order of the book. So the first 10 episodes are many of the ones from authors you saw on Tuesday and some other authors, the Hoff stories. Um, we're going to release them in batches every week, probably till it'll probably take us to the end of November, maybe first week of December. So by the time that December rolls around, all the ones we recorded will be out. They'll come out in batches. And they are 15 minute episodes where one member of the Star Wars books team sits down with an author and talks deep behind the scenes of their particular story. So if you want to hear more about Rob developing his story with Real World Hood, we have a great episode for you. If you want to hear more about all of the technical uh, stuff and cool technology and things about TIE fighters that um, we had to dig through in order to uh, make Amarakel's rules for TIE pilot survival probably um, work out well, Django and I did an episode about that. And all of the wonderful authors here did episodes they're all really wonderful. They're all great. They are all super spoiler. We talk about like, Lydia, the last line of your story. And you know, what about this moment? Um, so definitely encourage you to finish reading the story before you listen. But it's like, think of it like an after show for from a certain point of view. Um, so you can check out, I put the link in the uh, chat that's got links to like, if you prefer Spotify and, or Google Podcasts or whatever, it's got links to those, um, those places too. But anyway, that was that. So now turning back to all of you. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, I'm gonna start with Karen. Uh, if you could write yeah. one for 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 Return of the Jedi, what, what's your first thought of like, oh, this is going over? 
Uh, I think I want to maybe write, maybe write one of the people that are on Java's like land rover thing over the over the um, Sarlacc. The barge. Yep. Yeah, they'll die, but you know they could live, go out in the flame of glory. You know, their last <laughs> thoughts before they it, it explodes. Yeah, maybe it's she could. Maybe maybe they could be witnessing when Jabba the Hutt gets choked out. You know, and then you know they could be like a point of view from that perspective. It's a, it's oh, a pretty public event. <laughs> Jabba's getting choked out. So yeah. uh, that's a pretty good one. Uh, anyone else have one that they have thought? It's of? easy for me because it's a story I've always wanted to write. Is oh. uh, the uh, Imperial soldiers on Endor after the battle are running away and they're like hunted by murderous Ewoks. And it's, <laughs> it's part of darkness slash apocalypse now, but with Ewoks. Uh, the Ewoks sure are cannibals, right? They eat people. So this is like terrifying. I'm pretty sure uh, there's a mode in one of the Battlefront video yeah, games. Yeah, no, absolutely. Ewok hunt. Uh, yeah. So there is some precedence for this sort of um, situation. But so yeah, an Imperial squad fleeing on Endor hunted by murderous Ewoks. I'm in. That's pretty good. Um, uh, I would want to write my girls again. I would want to write the the Millennium Collective again because we get uh, Lando doing his own Death Star run and blowing up the Death Star. So it'd be a nice time to to write him um, literally in the pilot in the pilot seat again. Um, but if not the Collective, then I would want to write Ula. So she she meets a sad end, but I, I'd. Yeah, she's she's kind of the first black woman in Star Wars, so yeah, I would I would want to write her or my girls in the collective. Those are good choices. Those are good choices. Uh, who else? Who else has one? Um, I want to write uh, the the band. You know, one of the 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 fans. I I looked it up because I didn't know the name of the band, but they're called Max Rebo. Max Rebo. Rebo. Yeah. So I want one of those guys. You know, one of those. One of them. Yeah, I don't know the singer. <laughs> The, the el you know, the blue kind of elephant guy. <laughs> so one of those point of views, yeah. It's like, I always want to squish that guy's face whenever he comes up on the screen. <laughs> so it's so so like, sort of like, <laughs> you really soft. Um. That's a good one. Max Rebo, Max Rebo would be great. And you know, we had um, Figure and Dan in the modal nodes, the Cantina band in A New Hope. So, you know, bring mm -hmm. the musicians back in, it's pretty good. That's I kind of like my my instinct is to want to do something that's like a non-droid and a non-humanoid character like Sarlacc or like the giant space worm or like some animal on Dagobah. So I don't know. I, that's my first instinct. Of course, I'd have to think that through and wonder if it could actually have a reasonable character arc, in a short story. I don't know. But that's the first thing that I just sort of came into my mind. Was well, if these two books have proved anything, it's that <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely can figure out a way to paint compelling stories about a pile of rocks that's a cave, a giant space worm that's in an asteroid, uh, the monster in the garbage compactor. Uh, you Perfect. Know, um, Wait, Lydia, so there was a tweet going around earlier today that said, if we learned anything from the Mandalorian because of the way that uh, Baby Yoda just eats anything, is that like, Yoda was the apex predator on Dagobah and like everything <laughs> in that ecosystem must have been terrified of him. You know, I like, believe that. I believe he was like incredibly omnivorous, like right. ferociously like, omnivorous. Slurping down any. I mean, like, animal. what was in that stew? Yeah. Maybe they'll write the story of what made it into this stew. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, and I, and well and from a certain point of view, number one, Gary D. Schmidt, who wrote a Yoda story, writes a scene about how actually Yoda is planting, he plants crops on Dagobah, and he actually has to, like, he has his like winter home where he plants crops because of the way the seasons change. So, um, oh. Maybe he's not the apex predator, um, or maybe maybe, maybe. Um, that's worth exploring. Um, Rob, are you going to continue the adventures of Wilbur Hood? <laughs> nah, I, I want I want an Ewok. Want I'll take Ewok? an Ewok. Yeah, I, I I seem to remember there's like this one little scene where like there's this these two little Ewoks and like one gets blown up or killed and the other the one, one just yes. makes like the saddest face. And yes. I want to write that Ewoks revenge story. Wow. <laughs> they, that, Ewok, that story can maybe overlap with Django's story. They, they, they go them. after the yep. uh, I, I, I I joked about this twice, and I'm happy to joke about it a third time, where, you know, when you think about it, a certain point of view, Return of the Jedi is probably 35 Ewok stories. And, <laughs> like, you know, Brittany doing L3 and Lando again. <laughs> like, that's really kind of probably what that is. 
Um, and maybe then one person writing the Sarlacc, so we get our like really, uh, you know, Olivia, you're writing the Sarlacc, you know, so we get our very outrageous sort of creature character. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably where that goes. Um, the problem is, aside <laughs> from the Ewoks, almost everyone we meet dies, right? Like everybody on the sand barges, yep. everybody on the Death Star. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot of things get blown up in Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Well, you know, we had a lot of doomed Imperials in in the Empire one, so yeah. there, there's a way around it. But yeah, there's there's certainly, um, you know, that that just means you know where your story ends, which is, I mean, heck, knowing where to start your story and knowing where to end it is often maybe the hard, <laughs> two of the hardest things to do. Uh, but anyway, I want to thank you all one more time, and I want to thank everyone again at University Bookstore. Thank Dwayne. Thank everyone who came to watch. Like I said, people came to hang out for three days with me, um, staying up late if you're on the East Coast like I am. Uh, this has been, um, you know, I, I honestly, I wish we could have done this in a big room at New York Comic Con or some big thing with, you know, 19 or 20 people, but um, this was absolutely wonderful. I want to thank everyone again. I want to thank everyone for writing. Thank everyone for reading. Um, and uh, we hope everyone has a really great uh, end of your week and a wonderful weekend um, and enjoy the book and enjoy the podcast uh, if you choose to listen to it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dwayne. Thank you. Thank you all thank for coming. You. It was lots of thank fun. Thank you so I much. Enjoyed this week. Have a good night. Thanks.